last two years that you've been a member. Uh, I just want to say thank you about your services and help and the uh, changes couldn't have happened. These things and the best that we planned that just wouldn't happen. Um, so from the just let you know that this is their website. This is the primary way to get a hold of us and find out what's going on. It's has links to all of our um, places on the internet and here at the, the college where we have our schedule of events posted and our videos that we make here each week get posted eventually to uh, YouTube and then shared on our video sharing site. Our meetings are Wednesdays from 11 to 1 p.m. in CC3234, that's over in the new building. Uh, we usually talk about club business and then break out the robots, the Lego Mindstorm robots, play with them if anybody wants to experiment with that. Um, and talk about project planning. Uh, speaking of projects, uh, we have Linux Fest Northwest uh, coming up April 27th through the 29th. That's going to be over in Bellingham Community Technical College. Community College. Um, any of the members, uh, it's open to all students of Cascadia, uh, but we will uh, request that they join the club so they can get on our roster, so they can get on the mailing list, and then uh, get, we need to know a number so we can book the right amount of rooms at the hotel for everybody to stay at and get meals, uh, budgets, and stuff like that. And then uh, we got the Spring Technology Fair we're putting together May 25th. 1 to 5 p.m. in this room and that room. We're going to have as many speakers as we can book up to four. We've got four hours to fill. Um, we'll be speaking over in that room and in this room we'll have different workstations set up with different technologies, different programs, some game design software. Um, hopefully everything will run smoothly and we can use this room. Um, we don't know what's going to happen next quarter as far as who's going to be using the room at this time. Hopefully it'll be the same as this is for. Um, and that is an opportunity for all students to put um, together a slideshow presentation of any of the projects that they've completed over the quarter or in the past since they've been here at Cascadia. And we're going to make a, uh, like a PowerPoint presentation that will be ready for uh, a part of the, the presentation. And then we'll have uh, opportunities for you to do a little mini exercises on the computers to kind of give you some hands-on experience with using different software. Uh, maybe setting up a router. I don't know how long that would take, but we'll work with Chris on that to see if we can make some really mini, mini lessons. Um, so that's basically what we're up to. Um, I want to turn it back over to Brian to introduce our speaker, and we can have some fun. Thank you. So uh, we've also started at the speaker series to uh, have Rebecca Cooper come up and tell a little bit about some of the internships that um, she's been, been uh, discovering and uncovering and uh, out there hunting for. Uh, some really exciting work that's, that's really open, um, kind of a variety, with a variety of businesses, large, small businesses, profit, for-profit, non-profit, uh, projects that would span uh, you know, multiple quarters, projects that might be done in teams, projects that you can do individually in one quarter, uh, some paid, some unpaid, so lots of variety there, and we've really seen the internship um, opportunities just uh, expand uh, tremendously. So I want uh, Rebecca to tell you a little bit about those, and then she's actually going to introduce the speaker. Well, Brian, Brian pretty much said it all, so that's thank you, Brian. <laughs> um, I'm Rebecca Cooper, the internship and we do have a quite a number of internships available on Brian's, I call it Brian's website. Is that good? The internship With website. The internship website. So if you go to my Cascadia <coughs> and click on classes and internships, you'll be able to view all of the internships that are currently available. Like Brian said, there are some that are paid, some that are not. But you can get credit for all of those. That are, it's a really important part of your program because it's a requirement. And also it's a great way to get your foot in the door companies to find out, you know, that are these companies you can work for, you can, and most importantly, you can get it, you know, something really substantial, something really needed to put on, on your resume. So I highly encourage you to open these doors 
for students to make those connections. It makes all the difference when you go up to the district. So to be able to say, I not only have this education, but I also have this experience. So I highly recommend the look at those. And come and see me. I'm located over in the library annex. Um, so make an appointment to come and see me, either by email. I'm at R. Cooper. Am I writing this down? R. Cooper at Cascadia. These computers running in here makes it hard to hear back there. Thank you for not attaching it to Brian. <laughs> that you can probably dedicate your lifetime to learning it and not learn it all. Which is why I want to focus on these areas because what you'll find is that there's enough diversity. Cisco is not just generic Cisco routing and switching. There's a, a tremendous amount of diversity um, within the technology uh, areas. In fact, there are, Cisco breaks it down into specific technology tracks. And what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about these technology tracks. And the, uh, the, the big, uh, do I go enterprise versus service provider? Where do I focus my time? So that you can see, for example, if you want to do the voice stuff, you read 
that the voice engineers are getting paid 300K. So you think, okay, I want to go to voice. So if, if you're going to do voice, um, you probably want to focus on the enterprise technologies, okay? And so hopefully what this is going to enable you to do, if you decide to follow the Cisco track, it's going to allow you to focus sooner rather than later. Because what you're going to find is you might do like what I did, bundle around in all of the areas for a few years before you find the area that you really like to go. So my objective is to try to help you decide where to focus first. And on that note, I would say it would not hurt to at least delve into each of these just a little bit to find out if this is the direction you want to go. To find out which of these areas you like the best. I was uh, mentioning to Rebecca before I started that I, you know, I lived at the 300K salary myself, and that's why I started playing with the voice technologies. What I realized was that I really liked playing with the voice stuff. <coughs> it's like toys, okay? It's, it's, it hardly even seemed like work. And I didn't even realize that I would like doing that stuff as much as I did until I actually tried it. So that's why I say it's probably not a bad idea if you just at least dabble in each one of these areas a little bit. For example, you might find that you just really get off on BGP and MPLS. And if you do, don't focus on the enterprise. If, if you really like BGP routing, BGP is the, is the routing protocol of the internet. Uh, while we have multiple uh, interior routing protocols within an organization, within an autonomous system, within a system that is under our control, we can do old OSPF or EIGRP or RIP routing, but on the internet itself, there's only one routing protocol. That's BGP. And if you find that you like working in BGP, service provider is probably going to be the area that you want to focus on. And CCIP, the service provider uh, track, would be the area that you would go down there. If you like working with large carrier class enterprise uh, or uh, uh, service provider, I should say. So what I would like to do is, first of all, just mention the fact that there are, and, and before I even start talking about the actual tracks themselves, well, I mean, I'll, I'll back up, I'll come back to that again. Um, there are specific tracks. Uh, everyone would probably begin with the CCNA track. The CCNA is going to give you a very uh, basic foundation. One of the things I used to like to tell my students is it's very important. Number one, uh, if you don't remember a lot of the stuff tomorrow, don't sweat it. Because repetition is going to be the key to learning this stuff. You have to do it over and over and over and over, which is why the uh, employers like to see experience. And what you need to do is you need to fill in this foundation. You have to do your time. And one of the important things to understand is you might be presented with with a concept that just doesn't, it just doesn't sink in just yet. You just can't quite get your head around it. Okay? But don't let that bother you. And here's the reason why. Because maybe that concept is being presented up here. And what you're going to find is that until we have all these blocks filled in in the foundation, which is where the CCNA comes in, until we have all these blocks filled in that foundation, some of these other blocks, they just don't, they just don't fit. They, they might just fall right through the cracks. So this is very much uh, where we have to build on top of what we already know. Again, one of the reasons why employers like to see experience as opposed to just uh, book learning. Let me say this about that. A lot of people may poo-poo the certification tracks. I computer's paper cert. That's when I usually follow that with, uh, you don't have any paper certs, do you? Because those paper certs will at least get you in the door. One of the things that is important uh, that employers already understand is that the certification process forces you to present an objective measure of what you already know. It's, it's an objective measure that, that they can use as a baseline to have some idea of what you know. 
And plus, the certification process forces you to have to maybe study something that you wouldn't have actually studied on your own. And therefore, and that, what you might find is, well, maybe that's the next uh, concept that's going to get you in the door at your next interview. Or what you may find is that's something that your employer, your current employer, could actually use right now. That maybe they're not doing things as efficiently as they could. So it's all these real subtle um, concepts that we might either just glance over or not quite fully understand that if we don't go and sit for that exam, we may not quite grasp that to the level that we should. So I will always encourage certification. Don't let anybody poo-poo the certs, but understand that the cert is not everything. It will get you in the door, but they want to see some experience as well. You need to be very well-rounded. Okay, so let's go back to the pyramid. So if something doesn't quite stick, don't sweat it. What you're gonna find is that stuff that you may have trouble learning today Tomorrow will be very easy. And you almost don't even think about it. But you get to the point where you start, you go back and start learning these routing protocols all over again for the second time. And you think, why was this so hard the first time? Why did this seem so hard? It's, I picked the stuff up like that now. Well, it's because you've got the base filled in. Okay. So I would always encourage, and even if you go, if, if you're going to stay in IT, which I would encourage everybody in this classroom to do. And I'm also very pleased to see that there's a nice, healthy mix of um, uh, men and women in the class. This has traditionally been a very male-dominated field, but I guarantee you the ladies get paid just as much as the men do uh, in network engineering. There's no bias uh, when it comes to network engineering. Uh, CCIEs uh, don't make, doesn't make any difference uh, if you're a man or a woman to make the money. So I'm glad to see that. It's great opportunities uh, for ladies as well as the guys. So even if you're going to go in another direction, say you want to go systems administration. I kind of got burned out on, on building Linux servers and building Microsoft servers and having stuff change every couple of years and having to relearn stuff. Now, you might like that. Um, one of the nice things about the network engineering side of the house is that we don't see quite as much change. We tend to build on concepts that we already know, and while things continue to advance, we don't just forget about how we were installing Windows 98 uh, last year and learn a Windows NT or Windows 2003 or 2008 this year. Or, I mean, I'm constantly struggling with my outlook 2010, everything's different than it was in my outlet 2007. You know, I can't even put a signature on my email. I have to go through and find out how to do things all over again. Okay? You won't find the same thing in the Cisco network uh, technologies. Uh, you will find that stuff tends to build and that you, uh, your expert level knowledge that you had last year will still be uh, good uh, this year. I used to build 2003 servers. Um, MCSE uh, in Windows 2003. I feel like fish out of water if somebody put me in front of a 2008 machine. So you see all that training, all that technology, all that learning, it did me very little good at that time. I don't want to, I don't want to put down the Microsoft program at all, but this is just my opinion, okay? Um, I tend to like, I tend to gravitate towards this more because I can continue to learn or continue to build on what I have already learned and what I know. And I'm, I'm hoping that this will help you make some decisions in the future yourself. Okay, so if something doesn't quite sink in today, don't sweat it. If routing seems like a difficult concept today, don't let that make you shy away uh, from learning these technologies. No matter which direction you go, I would always advocate that you learn something about the routing and switching technologies. Because even if you're in systems administration now, you can't, you don't, um, you don't exist in a vacuum. All these servers are plugged into switches. Either uh, Cisco 1000V virtual switches or uh, 3750 uh, hardware switches, 4507 the, the, and, and 6509, 6513 chassis, the real big switches. They, all these 
Uh, all these devices plug into switches. And it's important for you to understand how the equipment that you're going to work with is going to interface with the rest of the network. And there is a disconnect if you don't. We see it all the time. People who are in our network operations groups uh, that don't quite understand how all these things fit together. They're not going to go as far. They're not going to do as well as the guys who do understand how all these pieces integrate. So I'll always encourage you to at least start with some foundation learning in, C I would say, CCNA at a very bare minimum, or at least the, the uh, equivalent of the CCNA uh, curriculum, which is basic uh, routing and switching. Understand how, if, if you're going to go into IT, you know, learn those layers of the OSI model, and not so much just so that you can recite them at the bar and win beers, but <laughs> so that you actually understand that layer two is dealing with frames. And, and, and how we begin to encapsulate things at layer two. And layer three, how, how and why IP is different than frames. And when we start talking about the WAN technologies, NPLS, frame relay, it now oh, frame, we just said that word. It helps you to understand where these technologies live. Okay? Understand that as you send information from a PC to a server, that little tiny beam, it gets wrapped. Uh, what we call it encapsulated by a whole bunch of different layers. Where as this little beam moves to the top of the stack at layer 7, the application, all the way down to the 31st layer, the physical layer before it gets sent over the wire as either uh, light um, uh, or as um, electrical uh, changes in, uh, in voltage. Where we have Adjacent layer interaction and same layer interaction as this thing shoots across from one device to another and back up the, up the stack again. It's very important to understand how what you're doing is going to impact how that equipment is functioning with a server. So if you're on a PC, how it is interfacing with the server. If you're actually working with switches, how those switches Things are broken, what's going on? Well, let's check layer one connectivity first. Okay, we've got layer one connectivity. Do we have layer two connectivity? Is spanning tree broken? Understand these technologies. It will just, it will make you better at what you do, whether you are working in systems or whether you're working as a network engineer or whether you're actually programming. Because when you're programming, what are you programming? Well, you're programming all the stuff that's going to make all the stuff work, right? So it's almost like being a doctor. Okay, you're a heart surgeon, um, but it, it, it really helps if you understand not just how the heart works, but how all the other stuff that connects to the heart works, right? You don't just go digging into somebody's heart without understanding how all the, uh, how the blood flows through and all the other things that a surgeon would need to know, right? So it just makes you better at what you do. So I will say at a very, very minimum, start with this foundation. The CCNA is what's going to give you that foundation that's going to help you build those other concepts on top. Does that make sense? And you might find that you really like this stuff. You might really get off on the, on the technology. And what I'd like to do is then Cisco, the Cisco tracks have a, an, an associate level certification, the CCNA, a professional level certification, CCNP. This is at least in routes, this is route switch. I should stand over here by my foot. I feel at home. Standing over here by some switches. <laughs> Boy, these things are old. <laughs> um, so if you know if you decide that you like the route switch technologies, uh, CCNA, CCNP, CCIE. Um, if, uh, if I leave you with anything, I know sometimes money is not always the motiva motivating factor. Where's green? You got green over here somewhere? It's there on the Oh, there we go. But I guarantee there are some serious bucks to be earned with that CCIE. Okay? 
And I've had guys come right through my class. And I had this one young kid, he was 18 years old. Okay, granted, he didn't have a, 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 any experience at all. Went right straight through school. Finished that CCIE right clean out of school. Now, he's probably not going to go and start as a, as a senior network engineer. He's going to have to go you know, pay his dues. But you know, he probably went out and could command 120, 130K right out of school. Okay? That should be motivation to stick to the books and go through the certification process. And I'm not here just to espouse the benefits of making money, but you know, money's not everything, but it helps. You know? It really does. Okay, so within the route switch uh, uh, technologies, uh, CCNA, CCNP, CCIE. Now, what I, what I want to focus on before uh, I let you guys turn it over to you for some questions is at least let you know what these other areas, these other tracks are that Cisco has. Because uh, route switch is not the only track. There is also the service provider track. Service provider deals with um, carrier grade equipment. This is where we begin to see if you really like things like BGP and MPLS. <coughs> uh, BGP and MPLS right now uh, will get you about a dozen calls a day. People wanting you to come work for them. Um, there is an absolute vacuum of people who understand these technologies to the degree that they, that they need to uh, in order to be uh, productive in a, in a service provider uh, environment. What we see happening is that the, the rate of adoption of the MPLS uh, technology, MPLS is a multi-protocol um, uh, label switching. And essentially what it is, is like uh, we're putting switches in the core of the infrastructure as opposed to routing, we're switching. And when we, when we switch, we switch at wire speed as opposed to uh, routing, which generally um, uh, is, uh, routing happens in software, so it's, it's much slower. And we see the rate of adoption of MPLS uh, far outpacing the number of people who understand MPLS. Okay, so there's tremendous opportunity for people who understand both BGP and MPLS. Now, unfortunately, um, it's, it's not the kind of thing that you can just go out and you know, read a book and be able to go tell somebody, okay, I understand BGP and MPLS. You have to practice this stuff. But the, the, uh, the equipment is available to practice BGP and MPLS. Okay? You can get the equipment. You can go buy stuff on eBay for a very small amount of money. The 2500 series routers, on BGP, okay, so you can build a small lab, you can buy those routers out on eBay for $25. I know as students, uh, $25 might still be a lot of money, but um, you can buy the equipment relatively cheap, and you can also uh, rent the equipment, and there's also software that's available that, we, that will emulate that equipment, okay? And, and DNS, things like that. You can actually go and build a, uh, an emulation environment to learn these technologies. Okay? So some serious big dollars to be earned if you understand BGP and MPLS. These are the service provider I'm talking about, like the AT&Ts, the, uh, the T-Mobiles of the world. Okay? If, you, if you find that you want to go in that direction. And while we still have uh, MPLS on the enterprise side of the cloud, here we have a service provider. Enterprise, enterprise being uh, uh, this is your this is PSC, okay, and this is uh, AT and T over here. You know, we all have no while um, while PSC does have a substantial amount of our own fiber. You know, we still do have to interface with the service providers ourselves, uh, and, and we do have the um, the customer edge, the CE, and the provider edge uh, devices. So you know you still have to interface with the uh, provider edge devices uh, with your own CE equipment. So there is a small amount of configuration to do uh, BGP MPLS configuration to do on a, on a, um, uh, on a CE router, but uh, not to the extent that you'll see in the service provider field. Okay. 
So if you find that you, you know, while you're studying, you find that you like this, you want to understand BGP and MPLS, this is going to be the direction to go. So provide it. Okay, let's go back to, so route switch can pretty much go either direction, okay? You can go enterprise or service provider and route switch. Um, within the uh, route switch uh, arena itself, there's a tremendous amount that we can do with regard to uh, security. You might find, uh, unfortunately, people tend to tack security on as an afterthought. Where if you uh, exist in the world that I live in, uh, we see it a little differently, and that is it should be viewed more as a system, uh, a system that good security should promote good design. It should not impact design, okay? And uh, unfortunately, there is only, uh, there's only about 200 uh, security CCIEs in the nation right now. And for that reason, again, real big bucks, okay? There's about 2,000 uh, security CCIEs in the world today. There's about 24,000 uh, route switch CCIEs. So if you want to um, walk down the path less traveled, you might find that working with the uh, Cisco security technologies is the way to go. If, if, you, if you think that you want to work in uh, network security, then Cisco network security is really all there is, as far as I'm concerned. I, I taught the CISSP material, I taught the security material, I'm going to sit for the CCIE lab in San Jose, I've already passed the written exam, okay? I'm not coming to you with uh, uh, just information that I've read in magazines and books. I guarantee there's nobody that knows network security like Cisco CCIEs. There's nobody out there, don't let anybody else tell you any different. So if you think that you want to go computer security, Cisco security is the only way to go. When we have our IT <coughs> security guys come in and they talk, start talking to me, you know that uh, I work in the network group, securing our routing and switching infrastructure, and we have our IT security guys come in and they, they start to kind of poo-poo our Cisco equipment. Um, I, I ask them, um, well, how do you stop a, 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 a VLAN helping attack? How do you stop a double dot one cube tagging attack? How do you stop a DHCP exhaustion attack? You don't exist at layer two. Everything you do with your firewall is all at layer three. Okay. How do you stop a man in the middle attack? And when they have no answer, um, I basically just rest my case. Okay, so if you really want to think about network security, uh, Cisco network security is the way to go. And just like any of the other uh, tracks, we start with uh, CCNA security. We also have CCNA wireless. CCNA uh, design, what they call CCDA. CCNA voice. So, you start with the CCNA in, in any of these tracks. You might find that you really like working with the IP phones. Now, the, the, the IP phone technology has, I will say, it certainly has matured. The market has responded to the, the, the demand for uh, uh, IP telephony engineers. Um, there are a lot more today than there were uh, six years ago when I was looking at this material. Um, so they don't quite see the salaries today that they saw six years ago, but have no fear that train comes by again. Right now, we're starting to see things in the popular press that say, is 802.3 Ethernet dead? Is this the end of 802.3 Ethernet? What's going to replace 802.3 Ethernet in the access in the access uh, architectures? Understand that uh, we're working with a a tiered hierarchical infrastructure, core uh, distribution aggregation access, and in the access technologies. Now, granted, while we're still going to probably see Metro Ethernet uh, on the WAN side of things and 
uh, 10 gig and possibly even faster speed Ethernet uh, through the core. Um, in the access technologies where I'm living, uh, wireless is beginning to become very pervasive. And guess what? Our peers are not keeping up. What does that mean for you? Loss of supply and demand. A little bit of my econ before I turn it over to you guys. What do we have here? Uh, quantity, quantity demanded. This is P. This is uh, for, this is dollars, right? And um, uh, quantity demanded. And how does it see the demand is downward sloping, and the supply is upward sloping. Is that right? And as the demand increases, we go from uh, P star. Right? Isn't that right? As quantity demands, uh, quantity demanded increases, go from Q star, okay? Um, so as that demand curve pushes out, it drives that equilibrium price up. What that means for you is more bucks, okay? And so right now, uh, the wireless technologies, we are just starting to see uh, that wireless can be deployed uh, faster, cheaper, and it's now faster than our 802.3 Ethernet connections if we're still running 100 meg uh, to the desktop. Because right now, the N technologies can deliver with the, uh, with the beam forming uh, technologies, we can deliver up to 300 megs, and you're talking about even more to the desktop, okay? Right now, the, hard, the problem I have is keeping people off the wireless and getting them to stay connected to the wired network because the wireless is that much faster at PSE. Okay? Um, let's see if I can find something real quick. Okay, you're going to verify this for me, right? Okay, what I'm going to do, what I was going to try to do is show design, probably to a, a, a chief architect, and then that design goes out to the, the guys who actually do the configurations. Okay, so within the world of Cisco, there's a whole bunch of different directions you can go. It's not just route switch. Okay, it's not just dealing with these switches and playing with the routers. This is where it begins. This is why you have to go through this. This is why you've got to cut your teeth on these pieces of equipment. Because while this is the beginning, there's a whole lot more out there. And it, it represents uh, very, very lucrative uh, positions for, uh, for your careers. Okay? So I, I hope that at least 
I've got your attention, um, and that maybe you'll think about following this, one of the Cisco tracks, because there's a tremendous amount of work out there. Just go out to Dice, go out to um, uh, what's Monster or Career Builder, and just do a search for Cisco and look at how many jobs there are out there right now. Okay? And I know that you guys are getting ready to finish up your program here, some of you sooner than others. Um, if you want the phone to start ringing and have people calling you instead of you having to go bang on so many doors, this is a really good place to start. Más preguntas? Questions. Yeah, I had a question. Um, so, comparing um, the proliferation of wireless technology across the United States versus the proliferation of fiber optic cabling to the door, which do you think will, will win? There are two different, two distinctly different areas because while fiber optic to the door will probably win, uh, 4G is probably not going to go away in terms of the, uh, of the homeowner, but understand every single one of those rooftops out there is gonna be providing both corporate as well as guest wireless access for you to come in with your iPad, your iPod, every single device under your Blackberries, every single device under the sun that can connect to your infrastructure via wireless. So while fiber optic to the door may be the solution for uh, uh, internet access to your home, we'll probably not see, necessarily see, fiber optic to every single desktop. The wireless technologies in the access layer uh, are probably going to prevail. So I would say you could probably go either direction in that case. You're not going to find one surpassing the other. They will both uh, continue to um, uh, increase in, uh, in their deployments. Yeah. So the wireless is cheaper to actually put out there. It's yeah. cheaper for them to run. Yeah. So the profit margin is because they're charging more for the wireless for the most part than they are for my 4G is going to cost me more per megabyte than having that uh, at home. Well, understand that I'm not necessarily talking about 4G as much as I'm talking about like uh, uh, 802.11 technologies, right. 802.11n. And, uh, and what it will eclipse 802.11n. I'm thinking mainly in terms of um, uh, an enterprise wireless as opposed to uh, what we see on our handhelds, okay? Enterprise wireless. So when you go into an organization, it's right now, for example, we provide uh, both wired and wireless for guests, contractors, and employees to support both voice and data. So we'll need to be able to, just for example, the Blackberries. Um, it's a lot cheaper to run that on an 802.11 network within your organization than it is to let it stay associated with uh, the Blackberry server and uh, use 3G or 4G. So we just set the Blackberries up so that they use the wireless infrastructure when they come into PSE. Okay. Yes, sir? I'm fairly ignorant to all this, but I'm the wireless security, is it the same as the fiber optic security as far as how you design it, or is it like totally night and day different? No, well there are things, there are certainly similarities, but there are definitely differences as well. Um, obviously, when we're dealing with wireless and security, we have to be able to prevent the guy from sitting out in the parking lot with a plumber's logo on his truck with a big old pipe aiming right at our access point, setting up, you guys know what a can antenna is? For the Pringles can antenna, okay, I think, what's that? That's a Yagi, is that right, is that a Yagi? Or a, it's certainly a directional antenna. Well, it, it's, it's very easy to sit out there, and if we don't have our wireless infrastructure set up correctly to uh, potentially, I shouldn't be telling you guys all this stuff, but <laughs> potentially, we'll say, to, to take a one access point offline, uh, a, a legitimate access point, to masquerade as a legitimate access point, was referred to as a rogue, 
okay? And to get people to associate with, with that rogue access point, uh, now instead of a legitimate access point, and now we've just perpetrated a man-in-the-middle attack, okay? So now all traffic that's coming, you know, between uh, uh, point A and point B is gonna come through me first, okay? And there might be all kinds of good stuff that I can uh, sniff off that network, okay? So, uh, Basic network security is not going to go away. I think what the, the best way to answer your question is, there, with respect to the wireless, there will be more things that we have to think about securing. So there will be, uh, it will be more of a, a superset, okay? okay? Or that network security outside of wireless will be a subset of all there is to know. And in fact, when you get the CCNP in, uh, uh, in wireless, one of the classes is, uh, the, and exams is advanced uh, wireless security that you, that you have to uh, yeah, pass that one as well. There's uh, five exams for uh, the CCNP wireless. Yes, sir. Uh, so, uh, in your opinion, uh, when we're thinking about buying a, a laptop with a Wi Fi card built into it, and we want to, as consumers, go uh, surf at uh, Tully's, um, what kind of Things should we be looking for in our Intro Super AG wireless cards. Okay. They, there are three chipsets uh, in all of the wireless world: uh, Cineo, Prism, and and Aethros. Okay. Uh, the Cineo and Prism chipsets, and all, now all wireless cards have got one of these three chipsets in them. Um, the the Cineo and Prism chipsets are more what I would call like commodity grade. Okay. The Aethros is more of a commercial uh, uh, enterprise grade. The Aethros uh, Super AG radios are the radios that uh, that come in the Cisco equipment. I'm not selling them just because they come in Cisco equipment. They just plain and simply are better. Um, I set up the, uh, the, uh, the internet service provider up in Sandpoint, North Idaho. I'm sure if you guys have ever got a chance to go up there to Lake Ponderé and uh, this is the area, if, if you haven't, uh, get on up there sometime in the summer, and it's a beautiful, beautiful place. Uh, it's almost like Lake Tahoe was, what, 20 years ago? Uh, just beautiful, pristine lake. Um, I did a 17-mile shot across Lake Ponderé from the top of Schweitzer over to uh, Hope um, using the Aethro Super AG just on, on a 2.4 gigahertz wireless. That would be pretty much unheard of if we were in, uh, granted we did, have, we did have some big old 24 dB directional antennas and stuff like that. And it's, that is in no way anywhere near what the record is. I think the record is like 125 miles uh, with just 2.4 gigahertz equipment. They literally had to put the antennas up uh, above the curvature of the earth just because you know, we had to deal with, uh, with those problems. But if you're gonna be looking for specifically something in a wireless card, I would be looking for those Aethro Super AG radios. All of my laptops are Fujitsu because I know they come with Aethro's radios. Thank you. Yeah, they're good. They're good radios. I'll spray with this. Um, I just want to say something. Else. Um, by the way, congratulations on season today. Right? Oh, thanks. Well, I'm not quite there yet. I haven't, haven't joined the club yet, but I have passed the written. Thank awesome. You. That's awesome. Okay. Uh, my name is Chris. I'm one of the instructors from the network program. And I just thought maybe you could share with everyone with the uh, IPT6 day coming out in June. Um, what are the different plans, what are the different uh, hurdles that Cisco is, is focusing on to prepare for that day? And also with the proliferation of wireless um, and access points and infrastructures, what does IPv6 mean to that? It's in all of the exams now. So basically learn it. Um, yeah, we don't really have much choice anymore. You know, for years, uh, we could get away with uh, RSC 1918 private address space and uh, NAT in every incarnation, uh, NAT, PAT, DNAT, SNAT, whatever you want to call it, dynamic NAT, static NAT. Uh, well, that was nice. Those days are gone, okay? Uh, you basically, the bottom line is you got to learn the IPv6 uh, uh, addressing um, technology because if you go sit for uh, CCNP, I don't believe they, they, hit, they hit it in the CCNA yet, but any of the professional exams, whether you're talking about voice or route switch or service provider or security or wireless, it's in all of them. Okay, so they're, they're going to they're gonna drag you kicking and screaming. 
uh, whether you like it or not. So yeah, you're going to have to learn it. Yes. Uh, with IPP uh, IP6, um, do you even need to worry about routing anymore since everybody can have their own IP address? If it's oh, public? Well, of course we have to learn about routing. Yes, okay. absolutely. Yeah, just because you have your own IP address, we still got to get from A to B, right? Okay. We still got to tell it, you know, if, if, if you're in China with an IPv6 address and you're in, a, in America with an IPv6 address, uh, that traffic's going to have to go through a number of hops to get from uh, America to China. And it's, it's routing that is going to, uh, to get us there. Absolutely. Okay, I guess I, I didn't clarify. Um, what about, do we have to worry about subnetting anymore? Oh, well, subnetting's not going to go away. Okay, well, now granted, while we have, uh, there's an IPv6 address space to uh, not have to worry about uh, making little ones out of big ones, okay, breaking your slash 24 into multiple uh, slash 28s and so on. I used to, in fact, um, if you guys, you a quick question, quick question, here's how to learn, uh, a way to learn how to earn beers uh, with your friends. Um, <laughs> Go into uh, the bar with your, they got to be some of your geek buddies, uh, this, or else it's not going to work. And <laughs> bet them, uh, what is the, what is the third, what are the first two usable addresses in the third subnet, if I were to give you this, tell me the first two usable addresses in the third subnet. Okay, you gotta have the answer by now, or it's not gonna learn. <laughs> okay, so in the end of class, if you guys haven't figured out how to do that yet, I'll let you know. Basically, if you can, you got, unless you've lost any fingers, okay, you got eight fingers, so you can sub them um, very, very quickly, in fact. By the way, about eight seconds is all you should have needed to get that answer. Um, with respect to the question, slash, uh, uh, I should say, um, uh, IPv4 is not going to go away overnight. Okay, it's kind of like frame relay. You know, we're out, we're all learning MPLS now, um, but frame relay hasn't gone away yet. Okay, so and in fact, there's still a tremendous amount of uh, uh, information that's required to uh, to about frame relay to pass the CCNA exam. So it's not like you can learn IPv6 and forget about IPv4 subnet. It's, it's, it's going to be in a lot of places for quite a while uh, before we make the conversion. Okay. So granted, while it's going to be mandated, um, everyone's not going to, you know, you're not going to wake up one morning and say, oh, I've got to redo everything in IPv6. Okay. So it's going to be around for a while. So I'd say, yeah, you know, make sure you know how to subnet. Yes, sir? Well, from what I'm seeing, with subnetting logically, maybe you won't need to do that, but subnetting physically, like with neighbor discovery protocol and things like that, you're still dealing with subnets. You're, you're still people. dealing with subnets, yeah. Okay. You're, you're still going to have, uh, while you don't necessarily have to have RFC 1918 private address space, you're still going to have networks that are very hierarchical in nature. For example, OSPF v3, which is OSPF using uh, IPv6, is still going to have to be very hierarchical in nature. We're still going to have to have uh, route summarization. Um, we're still going to be breaking big ones into little ones, so it's, it's not going to go away. It, but it's not going to quite be the same thing that IPv4 or something. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, no, essentially, the bottom line is uh, we, we take one big chunk of address space, and as we, as we divvy it up among the organization, uh, those, we, we generally don't want to have a, what we call a flat network. We're, we're going to take, if we're talking IPv4 address space, um, we'll take a slash 24, okay, and we'll break it into what, two slash, okay, so I'm doing your subnet. Chris? We'll break that up into two slash 25s. Okay, how many addresses in slash 24? 256. Okay, 250. 250, 0 to 255, okay, um, slash 25 just breaks it up into two chunks of 128 addresses each, okay, and so while, you know, while we might have uh, a single slash 24, we might have like one building here and one building here and uh, a router here and a router here and this guy's responsible for 
uh, his 120 addresses and this guy's responsible for his 120 addresses and, he, and summarize them accordingly. Um, so just like it was mentioned, while we're not going to have IPv4 subnetting, uh, the, the concept of breaking a big one into little ones is not going to go away. Yes, sir. Can you tell a uh, little bit more about Cisco Voice and what certifications needed, and uh, what kind of jobs in this field? And you know, and just so, uh, there, there are. I could talk for 30 minutes just on voice alone. Pizza here. Because once you get into voice, you start dealing with call manager and operating the server. That is basically it's equivalent to like the PBX. Of, uh, of yesterday, okay? Then within uh, within voice, so, so we have like call manager. Oh, and I would definitely focus on uh, virtualization in no matter which area you go here, you can't go wrong understanding virtualization, okay? In Cisco world, that's the UCS technology, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to go virtualization in Cisco. All of my stuff that I virtualize, I do with uh, VMware, running uh, ESX uh, 4.1. Um, and a lot of these appliances, for example, the call manager, this is where I just, what made me think of this, call manager runs in, in, in an ESX 4.1 uh, VM, okay? So uh, you, can act, and you can download the software from Cisco. While it might be a very, very expensive, uh, you know, 4,000, 5,000, 20,000, depending on what some of these pieces of uh, software are, you can go get 30 day eval copies and get an eval license and get your ESX 4.1, put it on your 64 bit machine or 32 bit machine, you can get your version and run a copy of Call Manager and start learning it that way. Okay, so you can get this. And you didn't learn it here, but uh, when that uh, eval license expires, just build another one. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> they, it's not like some software that, you know, once you install it and 30 days runs out, that you can't run it on the machine anymore. Okay? And they won't, a lot of times they will not advertise that this stuff is running in a VM. But I thought it was very uh, funny one day, not funny, haha. -ha, but uh, when I started loading uh, my Cisco Secure ACS uh, server, which is the, um, the access control policy server, it basically is what uh, um, it's going to provide the access control to people logging into the network, whether they're logging in wired or wireless, uh, or coming in by a VPN, it doesn't make any difference. And as it was booting up, it looked like I was booting one of my Red Hat Linux machines. And I thought, what the heck? This thing is running freaking Red Hat Linux. And uh, it became apparent to me that um, it was running on Linux. And so uh, a lot of this stuff, and they don't advertise it. They don't say, hey, you know, if you know how to run Linux boxes, you can go ahead and run this on your bed. No, they don't say that. <laughs> but rest assured, the majority of the stuff that they're running now, these appliances, CSACS, Call Manager, all these things run in VMs. So Call Manager, this is the server that controls the phones. You can, you can go, um, and, and this would probably be like the, the CIPT, if, you, if you're looking at the exam series, uh, CIPT 1 and 2. Um, the guys, uh, oops, 1 and 2. The guys that are running the call managers today are probably, let's see, Walsh. Walsh is probably making 110, 120, 130 grand for knowing how to run that server. Um, uh, you can do the C, what is it, CI, uh, let me think that the contact manager. I'm trying to think that there's uh, Unity, which is the voice messaging system. Um, and I, I, I have to apologize, I just don't know the acronyms for some of these. I just haven't gone off in that direction. Uh, at least done a deep dive in that direction. But a uh, Unity is the, uh, is the voice messaging, what they call uh, uh, The uh, voice, shit, I forget the name of it. It's uh, the, the, the automated voice response. Okay? 
that, AVR? That's not, that's, that's not the acronym, though. But it, it's, you know, when you, when you call somebody and uh, it says, you know, so-and-so is not here, uh, leave a message. Okay, it's, it's that. Uh, Unity is the, is the Cisco uh, uh, product. Um, the other one is uh, Cisco Contact Center. Uh, and there's, uh, there's probably about two or three more other directions that you could go. Uh, I'm sure that there's at least one more. I, again, I just I haven't, done the deep, uh, haven't done the deep dive. We have a whole voice group over at PSE, and they don't let me touch their voice stuff. <laughs> <laughs> they're, uh, they're all union guys, and there's a, there's a union thing that goes on over there. Um, so there are like three or four different directions that you could go and specialize in any one of those. So you're talking about like a, a Cisco will have their server and uh, I guess uh, uh, you know IP phones all over the building or you know throughout a few buildings and organization. You're talking this stuff or um, what about the wireless carriers? Do they use some Cisco equipment as well in their networks? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Either Cisco or Juniper. Uh, Cisco and Juniper are the two big carrier uh, grade vendors. And within the, uh, within the wireless side of the house, um, there's also the, the Cisco wireless phones. So it, it basically keep people from having to worry about carrying their Blackberry. Uh, and essentially the way all the pieces snap together here is that the, the call manager is what uh, sits on the back end and uh, is, where all, is where all the phones register. And in these other applications that I was, that I was mentioning, Un uh, Unity and the contact center, these are applications that run on Call Manager. There are separate applications that just provide additional value. So, uh, and they might not call it Unity, they might call it Unify something. Uh, in fact, this is now a CU, CM, Cisco Unified uh, Call Manager, and they also have CU, CME. We can actually run a, a call manager on a router. So if you want to experiment with uh, doing like a voice, Cisco voice, you don't actually need to go out and buy a call manager or, or deploy a uh, uh, one in a VM. You can run CUCME on a router and, and get your IP phones to register with uh, CUCME. And so all of the phones are registering with either call manager or with uh, CUCME, and then these other pieces are uh, just additional appliances uh, or uh, applications that run in VMs that uh, add value to the, the whole system. Does that make sense? Um, I know that VoIP is new to Packet Tracer, but if students have Packet Tracer, I can't remember, is Call Manager actually in one of those devices? Uh, no, no, it's the Call Manager application is gigantic. There might be some uh, form of emulation yeah. for call manager, but it, it's you're certainly not getting a, uh, like a, a version of call manager. Just and just like you're not really getting uh, frame, re you're not really getting a frame switch in there either when you develop your frame relay uh, um, uh, labs. It, it, it's an, it's an emulation only, but I mean it, it might be enough for you to uh, at least be able to experiment. CUCME uh, Express is probably the best way to go if you want a real uh, live version of call manager running on a piece of equipment that you can have IP phones um, registering with. Let's give John another uh, And uh, the piece is here, so we don't want to keep that waiting. Uh, but John will be here for a little bit still sure. yeah. to answer some questions and do some networking. So um, the other kind of networking. <laughs> so uh, he charges too much for this. Uh, so please come up and uh, chat with him. Um, did you bring business cards at all? Oh no, they don't give me business cards. Oh, okay. They generally don't even let me out of my office most of the time. <laughs> they keep me. I'm, a, I'm actually a, a, a what they call it an R and D analyst, where for the most part they, they keep me sequestered in this little tiny space and don't let me out very often. We are honored to have you here today. Uh, so we'll bring that. We'll bring the pizza in over the table here. How many are there? Um, Four. Maybe let's have them out here. Yeah, that's crazy. Good news. 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 Good
I think I have a...